internet, providing an essential gateway to the information age of the 21st century. The world of information is yours for the taking. Water, the most common substance on Earth. It is with us every moment of our lives. But do we know the secrets of this amazing element? Where did it come from? Who bestowed water on our planet? And why? Perhaps only water itself knows the answers to these questions. There is just as much water on Earth today as there was when everything began when the world was born and acquired the shape and sensations we know so well. The system of the universe exists as a single perfect organism. All of its parts, including us and our Earth, are inseparably bound together by huge streams of information. And on our planet, water plays the key role in how the information is exchanged. In effect, it is the medium through which all nature is governed. Breaking its way to the surface through minerals and ores, water assimilates the vibrations of the soil and information about its specific biological and energetic features. We tested a sample of purified municipal water, which is sold in large bottles, and the producer puts a label on them which says it is the best water in the world. But it is empty and dead. True, it's pure and it's good, and some minerals have been added, but this is dead water in which there is no energetics and there is no life. Most likely, people do not sense any particular difference between naturally pure and artificially purified water. But any animal will always choose water from a spring, because this water is loaded with natural energies. Every one of water's properties is unique, and they do not easily fit into the generally accepted laws of physics. Science has not yet been able to answer the question of why water is the only substance on the planet that can exist in three states, liquid, solid, and gaseous. Why does water have the highest surface tension of all liquids? Why is it the most powerful solvent on Earth? And how, in defiance of the Earth's gravity, is water able to rise through the trunks of gigantic trees against tens of atmospheres of pressure? Professor Korotkov's laboratory has conducted numerous experiments on the effect of human emotions on water. A group of people were asked to project onto a flask of water in front of them very positive emotions like love, tenderness, and concern. Then, the flask was replaced with another one, and the people were asked to project emotions of a different type. Fear, aggression, hatred. After this, Measurements were taken on the samples. The water exhibited changes that were clearly in one direction or another. So love increases water's energy levels and stabilizes the water, while aggressive emotions reduce the energy and make radical changes in the water. I hope to show people through my research that water has a memory of its own. Dr. Emoto's laboratory does research on water samples, which are subjected to various forms of outside influence. The impressions made upon the water are recorded by swiftly freezing it in a cryogenic chamber. This is what water heated in a microwave oven looks like. This is the effect of a mobile telephone. Somebody said thank you to this water. Excuse me. 
You disgust me. With modern technology, it is possible to structurize water artificially. When seeds were grown under laboratory conditions using this kind of water, the soy sprouts had six times greater photon radiation than when ordinary water was used. Using structurized water makes vegetables ripen faster and increases the amount of useful microelements and vegetable proteins several fold. If we look at the shoots, the treated ones were long, even, and strong, while the untreated ones were short, thin, and weak. If we look at the plants today, those from the selected seeds have all ripened, but the ones from non-selected seeds have not. We have to say that using structurized water really does affect the growth of vegetables. A human being is made up of 70 to 90 percent water. An adult drinks approximately 2.5 liters of water each day in order to sustain his normal life functions. Another 1.5 liters is absorbed through the skin during bathing or showering. Water makes a long and difficult journey before arriving in our homes. It used to be common knowledge that a settlement could only occur where there was a natural source of water. Today, whether or not there is water in a place is of no importance because we transport water for thousands of miles using high pressure. In nature, rivers and streams always flow along a smoothly curving course. But any water supply system has multiple right angle turns. The natural structure of the water breaks down more and more with each such turn. Water from a water supply system which flows into our homes through pipes has various forms, crystals of various forms, but they are all deformed. That is, it may look like this. It can look like this or have these crystals in many other arrangements, but you won't see any symmetry or beauty. Water that flows in a floor panel heating system is devitalized and rotten. It sucks energy out of the people, plants, and animals living in that house. It actually steals the energy. It is well known that the water supply in many large cities is a closed loop system. After undergoing aggressive chemical purification and passing through powerful filters, the water in these systems is returned to our homes, still remembering the chemicals and the violence it was subjected to. Even stronger, however, is the informational pollution that the water accumulates as it flows down miles of long pipes through thousands and thousands of houses and apartments. We pollute water spiritually, and this happens on a huge scale. Why? The water adopts all of the hatred, all of the malice, the stress. The water is almost dead by the time it enters our body. Our Earth is a gigantic container of water in which all forms of life arose. And every living thing is itself essentially a container of water. With modern technologies, we can reach far into outer space. And as we attempt to discover life on other planets, the first thing we look for is water. I think our, all our society is run by insane people for insane objects, mm. objectives. In the 1800s, society sanctioned both approaches to healing. Patients had a choice of using either doctors called allopaths or natural healers called empirics or homeopaths. 
the two groups waged a bitter philosophical debate. The allopathic doctors called their approach heroic medicine. They believed the physician must aggressively drive disease from the body. They based their practice on what they considered scientific theory. The allopaths used three main techniques. They bled the body to drain out the bad humors. They gave huge doses of toxic minerals like mercury and lead to displace the original disease. They also used surgery, but it was a brutal procedure before anesthesia and infection control. Few patients were willing to have surgery. Most patients feared allopathic methods altogether. Satirist of the day remarked that with allopathic treatment, the patient died of the cure. Competing with the doctors were the empiric healers. Contrary to the doctors, they believed in stimulating the body's own defenses to heal itself. Instead of poisonous minerals, they used vegetable products and non-toxic substances in small quantities. They especially favored herbs learned from Native American and old European traditions. In the 1800s, doctors tried to stop the popular empirics from collecting their fees by denouncing them as quacks. Economic competition from the empiric healers caused the doctors to found the American Medical Association. But the AMA was a small trade association without political clout, and the balance of medical power remained equal until the turn of the century. Then, new medical treatments emerged that were potentially very profitable. Promoting these methods, the AMA joined with strong financial forces to transform medicine into an industry. The fortunes of Carnegie, Morgan, and Rockefeller financed surgery, radiation, and synthetic drugs. They were to become the economic foundations of the new medical economy. Ironically, John D. Rockefeller himself used only an empiric homeopath while investing in allopathic medicine. Surgery became viable with anesthesia and infection control, and doctors advocated expensive radical operations. These in turn produced the need for a large lucrative hospital system. The allopaths also discovered a new toxic mineral, radium. Radium fever swept medicine. The price of radium rose 1,000% almost overnight. Another costly technological industry entered the hospital system. A drug industry grew out of the booming patent medicine business. Ironically, many of the new synthetic drugs came from plants and empiric remedies. Drug company ads boosted the revenues of the AMA journal 500% in 10 years. The doctors changed educational standards and licensing regulations to exclude the empirics. Soon, only AMA-approved doctors could legally practice medicine. In a brief 20 years, the AMA came to dominate medical practice. Organized Medicine launched a media campaign to associate the empirics with quacks. The code word for competition was quackery. The cells of our body communicate with each other using light frequencies. Our DNA uses electromagnetic frequencies to reproduce itself. At the core of everything are protons and electrons, positive and negative, making all life magnetic. We are, as all life is, equipped with cryptochrome cells which allows us to sense those fields in ways we barely understand. We are beings of frequency, electricity, light, and magnetism. And to become this way has taken millions of years, a process which started with the very first cell.